Hello everyone, my name is Ira and I am a student from the Paleobiology Research Group at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I'm going to be talking to you about a very well-preserved skeleton of a dicynodont called endothiodon that was recovered from the Karoo Basin of South Africa. Before we get into that though, I would like to give you a bit of a background into dicynodonts. So dicynodonts are an extinct clade of non-mammalian synapsids that ranged in age from the Middle Permian to Late Triassic periods. Dicynodonts were the dominant herbivorous tetrapods of their time and they owed their success to the evolution of skull and masticatory morphology that aided in their herbivory. There are over 100 species of dicynodonts known from mid-Permian to late Triassic deposits, and they occupy a wide variety of ecological niches. Cranial characteristics of dicynodonts include a turtle-like keratinous beak in place of incisors that covers the masticatory region. And in some species, the presence of maxillary tusks is present, is present, which could be used for grubbing. Cranial anatomy suggests that dicynodonts were plant browsers that foraged leaves, hard plant matter, and perhaps even small invertebrates. The skull size of dicynodonts varies among genera. You get the small niacidon from Mozambique with a skull size of about 63 millimeters, all the way to the large endothiodon, which has a skull size that ranges between 220 millimeters to 511 millimeters. One of the first dicynodon genera to be described from the Karoo Basin of South Africa is endothiodon. This was described in 1876 by Sir Richard Owen following the discovery of an anterior part of the skull and a corresponding mandible from the Beaufort group of South Africa. So endothiodon in Greek means tooth within, and this describes one of its key diagnostic features, which entails rows of internal upper and lower teeth. The cranial characteristics of endothiodon are a narrow intertemporal bar with a pineal foramen often on a raised pineal boss, the laterally expanded uh, squamosal bone, a prominent swelling on the anterolateral sides of the dentary, a toothless anterior portion of the lower jaw that extends upward into a curved beak, and a deeply vaulted secondary palate of the premaxilla. However, the most unusual feature or the most unique feature of endothiodon is its dentition, which consists of rows of internal teeth in the upper and lower jaws that are organized in replacement waves called zahnrein. Endothiodon is known from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, India, and Brazil. One of the problems with endothiodon is that until recently, there was a lack of postcranial material. So most of the cranial study, most, most studies focused on cranial anatomy and dentition. However, in November of 2013, <laughs> Professor Roger Smith from the Ezekiel Museum of South Africa led an expedi expedition team um, in the Karoo Basin and found a very well-preserved skeleton of endothiodon. This particular skeleton was found by Sibusiso Mtungata, and this is what he found. <coughs> this skeleton on discovery was identified as a large dicynodont and probably endothiodon. As you can see, it is beautifully preserved and it has a straight length from the tip of the tail to the tip of the snout of 1.5 meters. Almost all the elements are preserved in articulation. So you have the skull, you have 18 articulated ribs, you have the vertebrae, the forelimb, the hind limb, the manus and the pes. So it's lying on its left side and most of the right elements are exposed and the left elements are partially exposed. So at this point, I should probably let you know that when I started this project, I had had no prior knowledge of anatomy or paleontology. So this was very difficult for me, even though I was very interested in it. So I had to spend a lot of time learning anatomy and <coughs> learning dicynodont anatomy in order to understand what I was looking at in the skeleton. 
So because of this, the bulk of my master's thesis was purely a description of the skeleton. This took a really long time to do, and the bulk of my results is, is the description. <laughs> so I took um, very detailed measurements of each element, photographs, I even um, photogrammed the skull. So photogrammetry, if you don't know, is a method of creating a skull model or a model of an object using high definition photographs from all around the object. And I did this in order to um, closely inspect the skull and take more detailed measurements that weren't, able, that weren't easy to take physically. So this skeleton, uh, this endothiodon skeleton could be attributed to the type species that were described by Owen called endothiodon bathostoma. Um, this is known by the robust pineal boss and the large skull size. I'll talk a bit more about the different species later on. So this, I'm not going to describe every element to you, but this is just some of the um, isolated elements that I described. So we have a left scapula, the right scapula is also preserved, the right humerus, ulna, radius, tibia, fibula, and right femur. I also managed to determine the phalangeal formula of endothiodon, which um, is 2, 3, 3, 3, 3. And this is fine because most dicynodonts have this phalangeal formula. So the right manus had some digits missing, but we do believe that the left manus is buried under the skull, under the left side of the skull. So when we get permission to lift the skull up and prepare that out, we might be able to have the full complement of manus digits. The right pairs had uh, a few digits missing as well, but that was okay because the left pairs was actually preserved ventrally up and it had the remaining digits. So as you can see, the ribs were preserved in a certain kind of curvature and this curvature could indicate something about its body size and its body shape in life. Most, most large dicynodonts would have had a barrel barrel shaped body. Also, one of the vertebrae on the vertebral column was disarticulated from the rest of the column and it was very well preserved. So using photogrammetry again, I was able to look at it in all dimensions and study uh, and, and describe it really well. And this, could, this indicated the morphology of the rest of the dorsal series. So the problem, the second problem with endothiodon is the taxonomy. Since its first description, endothiodon was broken up into many different species and it, the family endothiodon today was broken up into many different genera. Since then, however, that has been scrapped by Cox in, two, in 1964. And he suggested that there were only three species, endothiodon bathostoma, endothiodon uniseries, and endothiodon YC, and that basically endothiodon was one genus. However, the most recent revision of the taxonomy of endothiodon is still a tentative one, but it suggests that there are only three species, but upon discovery of more, of more skulls in more recent years since Cox's description, um, Cox and Angelzik in 2015 suggest that endothiodon bathostoma, endothiodon mahalanobisi, and endothiodon tulani are the only three species. Endothiodon mahalanobisi, the second one there, is a skull that was described from India. It is much smaller and is believed to be, it has its own otopomorphies and is definitely a different species. Endothiodon tulani is probably the most um, unusual of the endothiodon um, species because it has the presence of very small tusks. This is unknown in any other endothiodon species. So I did a tentative species identification as well, but this needs to be confirmed with further work. So as you can see, endothiodon tulani is the smallest of the three. You can't really see the tusks in this picture, but it, the three um, features that I focused on were the skull size, the presence or absence of a pineal boss, and the longitudinal ridges on the snout. So endothiodon tulani is different because it has the presence of small tusks and because it has no pineal boss, but rather a thin collar of bones surrounding the pineal foramen. 
And the thigh bone modern obesity is different because of the, the size of its skull, the much lower pineal boss, and the fact that it has one ridge on its snout. And in the thyroid bathostoma, the one I'm looking at uh, is unique because it has a very robust pineal boss that houses its pineal foramen. It has a large skull size and it has three ridges on the snout. So I looked at all the endothyroid skulls that I could find in South Africa in the museum collections. Unfortunately, a lot of these were fragmented and I couldn't do a full ontogenetic study. But what I could do is amongst the comparable skulls, I could put them in a certain kind of order. And the skull that belongs to the skeleton I described in my thesis was about the second largest among the collections in South Africa. So this doesn't tell us exactly the uh, ontogeny of it, but it does tell us that they are larger or slightly larger individuals. So uh, the master's project that I just, so my master's project was basically just describing the anatomy of the skeleton. And so I've now finished that and I'm starting a PhD. And these are the three main aspects that I will be, um, that I will be focusing on. So the first is I really want to confirm the taxonomy of endothyodon. I want to determine if there are in fact three different species. There has been debate in the literature about endothyodon mahalanobisi, the skull from India. And there has been a question about whether it is actually a juvenile of endothyroid bathostoma or if it is its own species. So I will have to look at the morphology very carefully and uh, in order to determine that. I am, however, convinced that endothyroid tulani is a different species, but I will want to look at that myself. Secondly, uh, I want to study the histology of the endothyroid dentition and understand its feeding system because it is probably its most unusual and diagnostic feature. Thirdly, the question you're probably all asking yourselves is if I have an entire skeleton, why don't I try and reconstruct it? This is definitely my plan, but I am completely open to suggestions because this part of my project is still in development. So because of the large size of the skeleton and because, that, because the left size is still embedded in rock, it is not possible at this point to isolate individual elements. I am collaborating with the biomedical uh, engineering team at the medical school of UCT. And we are working on ways to try and scan uh, the entire skeleton so that we can digitally isolate the elements and manipulate each bone in, to, in order to try and determine its posture, perhaps even a bit about its locomotion and its biomechanics. So in conclusion, this skeleton and this description is probably the most complete skeleton of endothyroid and bathostoma to date. And it is a good stepping stone for future work and it is also now considered by me to be a reference skeleton so that if we do find more endothyroid on bathostoma and we can attribute it to the same species, we can use this as a reference skeleton to compare it with. I would like to thank the following people for funding and, for, and to my supervisors for um, inspiring me to do this project and to continue into my PhD with it. And I'd really like to thank you all for listening.